Okay, we do appreciate that everybody joined us today. Uh, we think that we have a very interesting topic, uh, finding success for careers as a rotorcraft pilot. We know that this has been a very uh, often suggested subject for our webinars. Uh, people who are either building their flight time or are um, wanting to consider changing uh, industry segments are always interested in knowing what other requirements are. Obviously, we can't uh, address every industry segment all at one time. Today, we've got uh, a, a nice selection, I think. I'd like to start by introducing our uh, speakers today. Uh, replacing Jim Viola today is Chris Martino, our Vice President of Operations here at HAI. We also have Michael Sagely, who is a senior pilot for the Los Angeles County Fire Department Aviation Unit. We have Jay Diggs, recruiter um, and HR officer for the Maryland State Police. And we have Dan Aronson, chief pilot for Haverfield Aviation, uh, doing uh, utility inspections power line work. I'd like to uh, start today by reminding everybody that the advice that these gentlemen will give you in terms of their uh, career suggestions does not guarantee that you will get a job with them. If they tell you to dot the I's, cross the T's, and stand on your head, there's going to be a large number of people who are doing the same thing. There are no guarantees. This is just simply career advice, and uh, they're hoping to help share that uh, the information that they've learned. We do invite you to ask questions. The module on the side of your screen does have a question uh, pop out that you can type in a question. It will come to us. We will try to answer as many of the questions as possible after we finish our general uh, session with each person. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Martino. Chris, please bring up your camera and we'll let you do your introduction. Hey, Dan. Can you hear me okay? That's loud and clear. All right. I appreciate that. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I, I am Chris Martino. I'm Vice President for Operations here at HAI. And on behalf of our President and CEO, Jim Viola, I welcome you to today's webinar. You know, before I start, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like, I'd like to say just a few words on a heartbreaking loss the helicopter industry recently suffered. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about the recent passing of one of our industry icons, Jim Wisecup. Jim was a past chairman for the HEI Board of Directors and a highly respected leader within our industry. For any of you that had the good fortune to know Jim, you know he was a champion for safety and he never hesitated to share his knowledge and his wisdom with those around him. His enthusiasm for aviation was contagious and his good nature is something we will certainly not forget. We're all better off for knowing Jim and we will miss him. So we ask that you keep Jim's family in your thoughts and your prayers. For today's <laughs> webinar, today's the first webinar in a series where we invite people from specific industry segments to come talk about the skills uh, that pilots need in order to fly in those industry segments. You know, within our industry, there's some 50 different operations that helicopters conduct. Everything from heli skiing, air medical, utility work, you name it. Uh, there's a lot of different, different uh, operational pieces that you can get into. So that said, for future webinars, we would ask, the, please let us know what, what segments you'd like to hear about. Uh, we will use the input that you provide us and we'll develop future segments because uh, obviously we put these on for you. We want to make sure you're getting benefit out of them. So as Dan mentioned, today we have a great lineup for you. You'll hear from pilots who fight fires, who conduct airborne law enforcement missions, and those who fly utility, patrol, and construction operations. These are all critical missions, critical operations. And we hope you all benefit from today's lineup uh, because they truly are, it, it, they are distinguished industry professionals. Today's segment is also all about teaching and mentoring for pilots. And we're not talking about just initial training, we're talking about throughout their careers. Considering his dedication to training and mentoring, I, I have to believe that Jim Weiskopf would certainly approve of what we're doing today. So as you're watching this webinar, try to think back and recall either a teacher or a mentor who stands out in your mind because they made this special effort to work with you. People like Jim Weiskopf. And remember giving back 
time and experience is just one way that we ensure the strength of our industry. For you younger pilots who are with us, as you progress through your career, you might remember the three gentlemen who are here with you today, taking time out of their busy schedules to provide you with the advice and the mentorship that will help you land your dream job. And when you do land that dream job, think about how you can share your knowledge and share your experience to help future generations of pilots. So with that, again, welcome. Thanks for being with us here today. And I will go ahead and turn it back over to Dan and our distinguished panel. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we certainly did suffer a loss with Jim Wisecup. Uh, he uh, was an industry icon, as you mentioned. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, invite uh, Michael Sagely. Mike, to bring your camera up. Okay, come on. Oh, uh, Mike, welcome to uh, HAI at Work. We really appreciate uh, that you're able to join us. Um, from what it uh, sounds like, there's already fires burning uh, in your region, and so uh, we were lucky to be able to bring you in today. Yeah, that's that's the fact. It seems like it's uh, becoming an all-year uh, venture now here in uh, Southern California. Uh, yes, uh, that's the, the unfortunate uh, thing that, uh, yeah, uh, lifetime uh, or year-round uh, firefighting anymore. Uh, what can you tell me about the LA County Fire uh, Aviation Unit? How long have you folks been uh, flying on fires? Yeah, so uh, we had our 50th anniversary a few years back. We've been doing this for a while, and it's great to be a part of an organization that's got such a distinguished history. For it, I've been uh, I'm uh, coming up on my 12th year now, and I've been in a senior pilot position for about 10. So uh, it's 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 an exciting organization, and I'm happy to tell you all about it. <laughs> well, what kind of aircraft uh, does LA County uh, operate uh, on forest fires, wildfires? So we're operating two aircraft, uh, two different types of aircraft right now. We're operating a Bell 412, uh, our medium type two helicopter, and we uh, now have five S-70s. So I just brought home our two new S-70Is on Tuesday afternoon. Um, they were delivered from uh, United Rotorcraft uh, out in the Denver area, and we put them into action the very next day. So they're actually on the line now uh, providing the fire ship uh, position. Wow, that didn't take long at all. Getting well, it didn't the, take uh, long to get them in service. Unfortunately, it took a while to get them. It's a long process, as you all well know. Sure. So yeah, a lot of modifications to the airframe uh, for our mission specifics, but we're really happy with them. They're beautiful, beautiful machines. We're very excited to have them uh, working for us. I was going to say you're going to get rid of that new new helicopter smell and uh, fill it full of smoke right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk about pilots. What uh, what type of licenses or experience uh, do you look for for new pilots uh, coming into LA County Fire? Right. So we have um, fairly high uh, flight time requirements, and I'll explain exactly why uh, we've chosen to go that direction. But uh, right now. The minimum flight time requirements are 4,000 hours of pilot and command in rotorcraft, in a, in a, in a helicopter. Uh, commercial license, as well as an instrument I think it, which was an add-on. About two years ago, we decided to go with that. We felt like that was an improved safety measure for the fact that we um, operate in the conditions that we do within the mountains. We obviously are a 24-hour a day program, so we utilize night vision goggles, and we're doing that in uh, mountainous terrain in, in um, pretty fast changing kind of microclimates. And for the inadvertent IMC possibilities that do exist, we want to make sure that we have uh, that level of skill in our pocket to, you know, to improve our safety uh, margin on our, on our operation. Uh, the other part that uh, we're looking at actually, and we're considering where we want to go with this, is we require uh, 1,500 hours of what we call mountain time. And uh, anybody knows there isn't an exact definition of, of what that is. And we provide that in the posting as, as what we like to see or what we consider that. Typically what that means is above 4,000 feet in elevation, um, doing uh, routine landings and takeoffs and or helicopter operations. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure that our pilots are at a, what I would call a graduate level of performance in the mountains, high DA, high gross weight, where they have to manage power with the airframe to in very you know very narrow uh, performance parameters. We do that on a routine basis, whether it's part of our 
uh, firefighting or fire suppression operation or whether we're doing um, our EMS and or our technical rescue. We actually do um, as much as between two, 250 uh, technical hoist rescues in the surrounding areas, sometimes as high as 9,000 feet. And of course, with the temperatures out here, you know, we're looking at, at least in the 412, very, very close power margins. In fact, in many instances, we have to call in the other aircraft, the S-70, to perform that maneuver. So that's in a nutshell what we're looking for uh, as the minimums. You mentioned a bunch of things I had never considered. You know, I think of LA Basin as being, you know, somewhat near sea level. I keep, I don't think about the San Gabriel Mountains, the, uh, the mountains uh, that surround LA. Uh, the fact that there are so many uh, mountains in high altitudes. And then when you throw a fire into that with the uh, swirling winds and uh, the smoke and everything, I could see why you would need the extra experience. The thing I had not considered when I invited you to come in to talk was the uh, search and rescues, the uh, the hoist rescues. Um, how much of a split uh, are, do you spend each year between, say, firefighting or search and rescue uh, operations? Right. Okay, so what I'll do, if you, if you just give me one minute, I'll kind of give you a broad brush, and that'll sure. kind of answer your question. So our, our county is about 4,000 square miles, a little over. Uh, we have 52 miles of shoreline, and we work anywhere from uh, the Catalina Islands, so we perform over water flight, uh, all the way out to the high desert, and in between is the Angeles Forest, which ranges at 10,000 foot. Uh, Mount Baldy is right at 10,000 feet. So we kind of have that full environmental spectrum, and since we have such a large recreational area, and we're so spread out, the way our trauma system works, uh, we have trauma centers that are, are, are spread out throughout the county. And because of the large volume of traffic, as you can imagine, um, getting patients to those trauma centers can be pretty complicated. And, and in many instances, they're very remote. They might be out in the mountains hiking, they might be riding the motorcycles, you know, things of that nature. So we actually do what we call a multi-mission uh, operation. So we have that fire suppression, we have the trauma transport, and we have the rescue. And so um, I, I wouldn't say that it's divided up in thirds by any stretch, and it, each year is a little bit different depending on the fire seasons. But we do um, we do as many as um, close to 1,500 uh, medical calls a year in transport, and then I, like I said before, sometimes two to 250 actual hoist operations that are typically in remote areas, almost exclusively in remote areas. And then our firefighting operation obviously is in that. In as well. So it's not uncommon for us to be operating in the three and 4,000 foot elevation range and having temperatures that might be 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. So really high DAs, really stresses the aircraft. And, that, and that's kind of where that, that, that level of flying that we require is there. And we need to start with that because I think one of the questions you wanted me to cover was our training. We yep. do have an extensive training program when we when we have a new hire, but the expectation is that you're a well-rounded aviator and that you can come in and you can adapt very rapidly. We have to work in the urban environment. We're working in Class Bravo airspace. We work helicopter routes, you know, an extensive urban uh, environment as well as that transition into the remote area. So um, you kind of need to be a multifaceted pilot or be able to adapt very rapidly because we don't have a dedicated training section and we don't have dedicated training aircraft. We have to sort of kind of work that in with our daily operational needs and requirements. Um, so it's almost like you kind of come in and you're 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 ready to roll and you're and you're working with a, one of the four senior pilots while you're training. Um, we like to see you uh, signed off and ready to operate at least in the 412. Um, in that 60 to 90 day range, and, and quite frankly, um, it was much more complicated than I had thought when I first had entered it. And our training program, though, has progressed significantly in the last 10 years. So we've we've uh, done some really great things, and I think we're uh, our training side has really really stepped up. You uh, you mentioned you have four senior pilots. Um, do you generally promote from within or do you generally uh, bring people in from the outside when you're looking at a, a moving up? Well, we do. Uh, the senior pilot position is kind of the equivalent of an engine captain, I guess you might say. It's a supervisory position. Um, so my shift, my guys um, that I am responsible for on a given day. So, But if I work in a, an additional day, 
and I am the senior on duty, then it, then I'm expected to fulfill you know that leadership position as well. We do have a battalion chief uh, that is above me in the chain of command. So um, that position right now is uh, pretty much promoted from within our organization. Yes. Okay. What um, what's an average week like for one of your pilots? Um, are they working day shifts, night shifts, uh, mid shifts? Uh, what can you tell me? Yes, the uh, the schedule right now for us is uh, a 24 hour shift. So we're on for 24 and then we're off for 72. Now that sounds like a great uh, schedule and it is, it's it's fantastic. Um, however, uh, rarely do you have those three days off. And the reason for that is we staff three aircraft every single day, 365 days a year, that position or those positions, they do not go unfilled. So um, the rest of the pilot staff, which a full staff is 12, mm -hmm. 12 pilots to fulfill that duty staff positioning. Um, if there are not people who are interested in working overtime, then I can be recalled or the pilots can be recalled. And you're recalled in sequence, but what that really means is that if you're told to come in or you're contacted and you're recalled, then you, you, know, you pretty much have to go in. So um, that's one of those things that, you know, you need to make sure that you're, um, you know, that you're okay with, because let me tell you around here, it, it definitely can disrupt your, you know, your personal life. Um, and it's just one of those things. It's just a part of the business. So uh, in the fire season now, um, which typically starting around, say, late June to early July, we do augmented staffing. And augmented staffing means that we typically um, staff a HELCO, helicopter coordinator, aircraft which is the command and control aircraft and then we have an additional fire ship so we have five aircraft on duty that's five positions five pilots so you can see that in 48 hours you've gone through about 90 percent of your staff so yeah it's it can be a little bit rough at times um and we're all we're authorized within the department to to work five 24-hour shifts uh, that that raises a lot of eyebrows but if we ever get into it further down the road i can tell you how we manage that because that is a part of our safety management system is dealing with that issue okay yeah i, I don't know that we have time today but i that's right. that's certainly intriguing um finally um you mentioned uh, the minimums four thousand hours and uh, so many hours in uh, mountain flying what else can an applicant do to make themselves jump to the uh, the top of the resume stack yeah well, it's interesting. Um, what we've seen uh, in the last couple of hirings is the overall flight times of the applicant uh, pool are starting to kind of go down. I think that's, you know, I'm sure your uh, HAI tracks that pretty extensively. But the best thing that I believe that you can do at this point is, and I would, I would always encourage people to continually press forward because there's two different areas that are arenas here. One is the agencies. Right, like Los, Los Angeles County, Ventura County, Orange County, San Diego City, et cetera. Those agency jobs, those are kind of the, I would call those at the at the top of the tier that that uh, folks want to eventually work their way to. And 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 quite frankly, the positions for those don't um, come open routinely, so uh, you have to be ready to strike on those. And then there's the the firefighting side, whether you're working for a private uh, which are contracted to the Forest Service. So I call that sort of that that entry point uh, for the young folks out there that want to get into it. Unfortunately, it's kind of a little bit of the chicken and the egg. Um, usually the type two aircraft, uh, typically a UH-1, maybe a 212, a twin engine uh, helicopter, which if you're just coming out of flight school with the R-22, that's a little bit of a difficult transition to, you know, to move into those aircraft. But whatever you can do to get into those aircraft and start working, in that utility slash um, firefighting role where you're flying heavy loads, you're flying in environments that are difficult, that require uh, a great deal of power management um, when you're doing those operations um, in that austere environment, meaning out there in places where you know only helicopters can go. Um, and then uh, if you can, along the way, manage to be a part of the EMS industry, right and or any part of the rescue side so let's just say a typical military person has some rescue background he comes out he does a little bit of ems he works his way into the firefighting industry so the pitcher the ideal person is one who's had a little piece 
of each of those areas that I discussed in our multi-mission. Reality of it is a lot of guys don't, a lot of gals don't. They just, it, it, it's, it takes too long or they're interested in one particular field and they stay, you know, they stay within it. Um, the, uh, the firefighting industry is a, a relatively small circle, but once you get in and it's a very important to establish your reputation and your professionalism, <laughs> your word and your bond. The one thing that I found when I first did my private uh, contract that first year was I was just, I was, let's just say I was disappointed at the level of commitment and professionalism uh, for folks working that in that arena. I hope it's changed. I think it probably has because people are looking for that, that next best thing. And uh, I think um, establishing your, your professional reputation is, is also a very big piece of that. And then the last one, I'll be quick, is they'll hear the term or they'll see it carded or cartable. Unfortunately, in the private side, they don't want to spend much money on training, especially in a UH-1 or a two twin engine aircraft that obviously has some expense associated with it. So when they say, are you cartable, that means, do you have time in that particular make or model of helicopter? And unfortunately, if you don't have a factory qualification in it, it's 50 hours. If you do, it's 25 hours. So you say, well, man, how do I get 25 hours in a helicopter like a UH-1, you know, to get my first? So that's typically where I see a lot of the, the difficulty uh, in folks trying to enter the, uh, the arena. Okay, I do need to move on, um, but I do have yes, to sir. ask, would, uh, will simulator training count for those hours at all? It, um, that's a little bit of a debate right now. On one side, you want to say yes. On the other, on the other hand, um, we have not at this point accepted simulator time to make up for that 4,000 hours. If you have 4,000 hours of pilot and command time, and then you have simulator time on top of it that gives you um, some experience space in it, then you know certainly that will be looked at. Okay. Okay, flight well, time number you. two is not necessarily the biggest thing. I want people to know that. If you come in with 4,001 hours or you come in with 18,000 hours, the 18,000 hour pilot is not going to just automatically fire because of that. I, I want people to understand that that, that that number is just, it gets you in the door. The 4,000 hours gets you in the door for a possible look at an interview, and then from then it's on you. Mike, I really appreciate it. We'll bring you uh, back uh, in just a few minutes for the uh, the roundtable questions. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I'd like to bring Jay Diggs up uh, for please. Want me to turn my uh, video off? Please, Mike. Please yeah. okay. go ahead. Jay, welcome. Um, glad to have you uh, today uh, from the Maryland State Police. Uh, hopefully the uh, the hurricane that passed over Maryland yesterday didn't do too much to affect your uh, operations. No, we, we, they've been a little busy, but it's a shame we can't give Mike some of that water out there for some of his. <laughs> I, I would imagine. Well, hey, uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, Maryland State Police and how they use the aviation unit, uh, Jay. Well, um, actually, our aviation unit actually started in 1954, which incidentally is the year I was born. Uh, but our first medevac was conducted um, on March 19th of 1970. So this marks our 50th year of doing medevacs. And we've done approximately about 170,000 aeromedical transports since that time. And it's, we've been uh, quite busy. We have, yeah. uh, seven, <laughs> we have right now we have seven um, sections throughout the state strategically located. So we can provide, you know, the best coverage to the to the uh, trauma centers, to the local trauma centers. Uh, right now, we operate uh, the AW-139 aircraft. It's um, it's a full glass cockpit aircraft. It's got it has um, the flight direction, which is uh, essentially um, the flight director, which is you can plan an upcoming legs of your flight and pre-file that into the computer, and it'll just automatically fly you there when when you're ready to go. We got the um, terrain avoidance warning system in there. We also have a fully coupled autopilot, which essentially allows the um, helicopter to fly itself. You just have to land it. It's a four axis autopilot, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have the TCAST, which is the aircraft um, 
avoidance system. We also have the Spectrolab Night Sun and the, the infrared device. I think it's the MX15i, and it's it's used in a lot of the different missions. Our missions are are we have a our mission profile is um, in addition to performing the uh, aeromedical component, which is about 90% of what we do. Okay. I mean, whether it's on scene or factory or, you know, the remote, we also perform search and rescue. We have a lot of state parks. Our Western Maryland area, it doesn't have the, the mountains that uh, obviously California has, but we do have little ones and people get caught in there. And it is, it is obviously a different kind of flying when you're flying in the mountains. Mm -hmm. We also uh, have ramped up, obviously, over the past years, our homeland security details and um, also disaster assessment. And well, the other component is the police missions, whether we're doing, uh, you know, backups when when different events are occurring, you know, um, search and seizure, the execution of search and seizure warrants, or, you know, if um, if there's a high speed chase or something like that, you know, they're they're always involved in things like that, too. Okay, wow, that's um, a nice variety, and it sounds like your aircraft are uh, very well equipped. I got my first ride in the 139 this year, and it was an amazing machine. Absolutely. Um, what uh, what kind of uh, requirements are you looking for uh, when you're looking for pilots? What uh, what do you look for? Mm -hmm. Well, understand first that we we are a two pilot configuration, and so we have the second in command pilot, which is a person we require to have 1,200 hours. The pilot in command is, you know, is the commander of the aircraft, and for that position, it's 2,000 hours. Um, if I could encapsulate that, we, the pilot, uh, the SIC pilot, if you will, when hired, get 1,200 hours. They can have, we can, you give them up to 50 hours of full motion simulation time toward that. Wow. We also, we also do a conversion because the, most of the, I, I think, all of the military. They only count uh, time wheels off ground. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we give them credit for an additional tenth of an hour for every hour flown. So essentially, for a, somebody gets 100 hours of military time, they're going to get another 10 hours toward that 1,200. That essentially, just like Mike said, that just gets you in the door. That gets you to the interview. Sure. Um, uh, also, you have to have your um, your commercial helicopter rating, and and the instrument rating, and the at least a class two physical. Those are the minim absolute minimum requirements for the SIC. Okay. The PIC is two thousand hours again with all the FAA requirements. You uh, had mentioned uh, the military flight time. Um, I know that there's quite a bit of military in the Virginia, Maryland, uh, well, the whole East Coast. Um, do, do many of your pilots come from the military or do more of them come from the uh, civilian side? The overwhelming majority do come from the military. Uh, we do have we do have a number of pilots that actually have dedicated themselves, you know, civilian wise to make this their goal for their career. And they start out as an SIC and become PICs. There is a, a method that you can become qualified from SIC to PIC. Um, you know that's that's explained on our state spec sheet that uh, people can look at online. But um, uh, yeah, it um, you know it's uh, it, it, it's a neat way to, to to progress through this program. Well, let's stay on progression then. Um, are there roles for advancement? And uh, you have the SIC, the PIC. Um, if somebody does want to make a career with the Maryland State Police, uh, do you promote generally within, or is there sometimes so you bring somebody in that has also uh, more experience from um, a, a different state uh, with airborne law enforcement or something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let, let's start it this way. Our SICs are come on, and they are eligible for a non-competitive promotion to uh, the second level of SIC, if you will within three years is if they get the, okay. you know, a good good recommendation. The same thing with the PIC. The PIC is eligible for a promotion in three years to a level three and in another three years to a level four. So there is progression alone right there. Okay. Um, as far as promoting, we, we always, always, always work to promote from within first. We've always, always done that. 
Uh, and the way it works is pretty simple. If you are stationed at a particular section and we have a vacancy open in another section, we will advertise it. There's a method to apply. If you're so inclined to want to move from your current section to the new section, then apply. Then we have an interview process with through the chief pilot and you know his instructor pilots. And then if you're selected, then you go through the training process. And then, but if we don't find somebody, then obviously, you know, we uh, we go to the outside. Right now we have our seven sections along with our chief pilot and his instructor pilots, our safety pilot, our field, uh, flight training device pilot. We have a complement of 77 pilots. So we're always looking for people. Wow, okay. Well, you talked about the seven sections. Um, I'm assuming that you generally work within the section you're hired to work in. And so, yes, sir. but the then if there's an emergency, do you move around or? Well, it, it, it's it's pretty simple. The um, when you are when you come on, you're you're asked to be assigned to a particular section. When you're doing your interview, we'll tell you what sections are open. Obviously, if you don't get the section you want, you can put in a transfer, and then naturally that just takes its normal progression. But if you get the section you want, if you, like Salisbury, and you have a family and you're down there, you're there for life. Unless you want to transfer someplace, you're there. That's the good part about it. Now, um, I'll go back a few years at our Cumberland section. You know, a lot of our guys are still in the guard and and you know other military obligations, and we had three pilots from there that were called up to Desert Storm. So obviously we had a need to backfill. So initially, just like anywhere else, we, we look for volunteers who can do volunteers. And if we don't have volunteers, then actually we have to assign it, you know, not, not unlike what Mike deals with, you know, on the overtime basis. You know, overtime is, you know, readily available too, you know, if we want to touch on that topic. But uh, yeah, but you're at a section, you're, you're there. It's It's like, you, that's your family. You're, you're uh, 11 pilots or so at each section, you know, 10, usually right now we have between nine and nine and 10 pilots a section. We're down a couple, but, and that many medics too. So, you know, it, they, they get to know each other very, very well. Oh, okay. Um, you know, that sounds nice. I mean, what, what's a normal working ship like? How, how, do, how does a normal week look for uh, one of your pilots? Well, uh, we have to work uh, we work around a, a modified program. It, it's it's actually four weeks. And okay. in the four weeks, you have to target 160 hours of work time. Essentially, think about it. If that's, that's the normal person. If he's working five sure. hours, I mean, five days a week, eight hours a day, that's, that's 160 hours in a four-week period. But okay. because our pilots at the section level work 12 hours, they work a considerably less number of days during the year. I mean, just 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 to give you a, a without taking any vacation whatsoever. If I, I as an eight-hour employee, I'm working 260 hours a, a year. No, no personal leave, no nothing. A pilot working 12 hours a day is only working 173. So on a, on average, they're working you know anywhere between 12 and 15 days a month. Okay. That sounds uh, actually uh, like a pretty decent schedule. Uh, it's, now it's, they could be they could be flying any time of day, any time of night, uh, any weather uh, with your aircraft. We're 24/7. Usually our ships are 7A to 7P, 7P to 7A. Um, also, uh, getting back to the shift part, we don't. One thing we don't do is we won't work on anybody generally more than five days in a row. Okay. Uh, we don't. We it just. It just don't. We don't do that because of you know the, the fatigue factor. You just don't want that to influence you know somebody. Also, we don't do something like you know work somebody one day and then have off a day and then two days and have off one day. No, no, no. If you're going to work a stretch, you're going to work a normal stretch, and then have a, a normal period of time. You know, we'll hear pilots talk about a lot of things, but uh, they never complain about their time off. <laughs> No, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody in any profession complain about their time off. So, um, one final question, same final question I ask Mike: What's the uh, what's the things that a, a pilot could do to help show that they are really dedicated and want to come to work for you? What can get them to the top of your stack of resumes? 
I think you hit on a couple of big words right there, Dan. Dedication. Um, this uh, we don't we don't regard this uh, position as a job. It, it's a career. There is a wonderful wonderful retirement uh, at the end of the, at the end of this career. And essentially, um, just to put it in perspective, is something that um, that Mike and Mike understands a police retirement. Our pilots are in the law enforcement officers uh, uh, program retirement system, and it's it's a great. They have all the catastrophic benefits that a police officer would have. You know, God forbid it if there anything catastrophic happened, but it's it's a wonderful program to to be in as far as retirement goes. Um, aside from what Mike said. You know, Mike, Mike brought up a lot of good things to do. Um, experience in turbine and twin turbine with instruments is, is is critical. The more you have, and obviously in the Robinson aircraft, unfortunately you don't you don't get that. Um, but I'll tell you right there, you talk about the dedication and show that you really want this position. I can give people this biggest advice: you should educate yourself on the mission of the Maryland State Police and the aircraft of of our command uh, before you even come here. Educate yourself, know what you're getting into, especially um, because we have civilian pilots that work with sworn troopers. This trooper is the gun component, is the enforcement component in that aircraft. Um, so you're gonna be working with troopers. It, it, it goes a long way at the interview when somebody knows what we are all about. Um, we also encourage, when possible, to set up visits to our sections. Come see our pilots. Come see our medics. You know, you may you may see the medic there and say, hey, you know, I'd rather do this. Of course, understand if you want to be a medic, you got to go through the police academy. <laughs> Something we all enjoyed so much. But um, <laughs> it it shows it it shows that you want to be a part of this world-renowned organization, which is the Maryland State Police Aviation Command. We are known worldwide. You know, many countries have come to see our our organization, to see how we operate, to to model this particular group of, of individuals. I mean, let's say, face it, we're, we are a part of a wonder, wonderful system with our first responders, you know, at the scene level, us and the trauma centers that we have. We are so, so lucky in this state to have this for sure. And we are grateful that you were able to join us today, Jay. Um, I'm gonna ask you to bring your camera down for a little while and we'll bring you back up for the question and answer session here very shortly. But thank you so much, that uh, that was fascinating. Really appreciated it. You're welcome, Dan, thank you. And Dan Aronson, can you bring your camera up please and microphone on? Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> there we right. go, Dan. We got it working. I apologize yeah. earlier. Let me turn this a little bit. I didn't get a chance to really make this all work. Uh, we kind of uh, had no right That's, uh, you know, everybody understands uh, technical issues. And there's not very many of us that have not experienced uh, a bad computer point at some point or another. So he was doing the. He got another computer uh, working here while you guys were starting. So that's what happened. That's why it came on unexpectedly. So I think we got uh, it under control. Well, yeah, it looks like you're freezing up a little bit here and there, but I think we can manage with that easily. Okay. Uh, so tell me, what does Haverfield do and what do you do for Haverfield? Okay, well, Haverfield um, is a, a power line company. The way you'd like to think about it, it's Haverfield Aviation, but what I like to tell everybody, we're really a line contractor that uses helicopters, okay? We have um, about 170 employees. We probably have about 30 pilots. Um, some are, you know, some are, your contract, most are full-time. Um, we have 60 to 70 linemen, um, and of course mechanics, uh, you know, hazmat drivers, that sort of thing. And what we do, uh, we operate our fleet consists of 23 uh, MD500s. We have okay. one UH-60 alpha model that we purchased about three years ago. We use it primarily for power line for heavy lift. We have a UH, uh, UH-1H uh, for medium stuff. And then we also bought recently a VK-117 uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a C2, but it's upgraded with the uh, new, with the uh, Airworks STC for increased uh, performance. So it's a Cat A helicopter. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we bought that for is we do a lot of power line operations, um, and what we do is everything from infrared patrols and inspections to energized work, where we're actually 
bonding on to the uh, energized circuit of the platform. We also do a lot of you know, rope pulling, sock line, construction, um, and of course, a lot, of, a lot of that involves what we call is call HEC or human external cargo. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, we're not, you know, if you were a search and rescue private organization, it'd be a you know, class D load. Uh, but since we are hauling our own people, our own linemen, um, it's a class, it's a class D load. So, um, but one of the reasons, so we don't have to have a transport category helicopter. We do a lot of this with the single engine helicopters, but we just bought the BK for higher, you know, for jobs that are basically have more exposure where the linemen mm -hmm. are working off the long line for longer periods of time and maybe between circuits where there's no, you know, good option in case of a single engine, in case of an engine failure. So that's the reason why I bought the DK-117 uh, to, you know, obviously minimize the risk of, of a power plant failure during those operations. Uh, that makes sense. Now, you guys are obviously working closer to ground than uh, some of the other helicopter operations. Mm -hmm. What um, what kind of training does a pilot need to come to work for you? What are you looking for uh, specifically? Well, um, our company minimum, okay, published company minimum is 1,500 hours, all right? I usually like to see more than that, um, somewhere in the two to 2,500 hours. What we'd like to see, so one of the advantages we have, we we're not throwing our pilots, unlike you know a Cal Fire and some of these other companies, they're throwing their pilots right into you know, high mountainous terrain, uh, external load operations. We have the ability to take our less experienced pilots and start them on the easier work, uh, patrols, inspections, and they are with our own linemen. So at that point, they have they have um, you know they have a, a experienced foreman who can guide them through the hazards of the wire environment. Now we have our own training, we have our own company NDOC, patrol inspection. And then once they get a certain amount of hours doing patrols and inspections and they're comfortable with the wire environment, uh, then we train them on the platform, class A loads uh, for doing, you know, for doing the you know, bonding on, energized work. And then eventually we train them for a long line, unless they have previous long line experience, we train them for long line experience, we train them and they have to get so many hours of long line before they, or external load long line, before they can do a human external load. And then we train them for sock line and all that. So as they get more time, more experience in the wire environment, we give them more complicated tasks and they're trained, uh, they're stepped up, their training stepped up for each additional task. What we usually like to see uh, as far as entry level pilots, if we can, um, I like to see long line, if we can get a, a pilot, a pilot who really wants to work here, if they have if they have long line experience prior to working here, that is a big plus because one of the problems we run into is we do a lot of work now with human external cargo. So mm -hmm. we don't have as many options. You know, we can train you and we can give you, you know, say, some hours but we like to see pilots with a fair amount of time before we let them do that operation so we have to give them jobs that don't require human external cargo like skid transfers those things so we we're limited in those type of operations so we'd like to see uh, we you know so it takes a little while to get those pilots up to speed so if they have long line uh prior to coming here that is definitely a plus we also like to see uh, i like to see some kind of utility time you know long line fire of course helps um, just because we work out in the field, we work in the cold. Um, it's going to be we work in the winter time at 20 degrees out. We work in the summertime when it's hot. So field operations are, are definitely a plus. Uh, anybody you know who's worked out in the field. Also, a lot of travel. Um, the you know we're traveling around the country. We work you know in every state in the United States. We actually work. In, we actually have a you know NAFTA LOA. So we work in Canada. Um, you know we we don't you know so so we work everywhere. We travel a lot. Um, so if I see, you know, it, it, I, you know, it's not a free wreck, but if somebody has experience, uh, you know, traveling or working that position where they're away from home, that does help, you know, you know, depending upon their personal life and their family and their spouse, um, some spouses can handle it, some can't. And that, that is usually uh, why we, you know, the major reason for some attrition here is the travel. Um, if you like to fly, this is a great company to work for. I mean, there's a lot of good, good reasons to work for this company, but the, the thing is, if you want to fly, um, we, our pilots will fly seven, 800 hours a year. So it's a great job if you love flying helicopters, you know, obviously everything is day, VFR, um, but you're out there working five, six hours a day, unless there's a weather day or, you know, or some other issue or a scheduled down day, and we work rotations. So the pilots will work so many weeks on, so many weeks off. Okay. So. Yeah, that was something I was thinking about as you were talking about uh, all the travel. If, if there was a rotation where, uh, you know, there is a chance to get home every so often. Yes, we try to work on one, you know, we, we tailor it a little bit from pilot to pilot, but we kind of like to see 
most of our pilots work two thirds on, one third off. So if they want to work, you know, 20 days on, 10 off, we have some that will work 20 on, two weeks off. I will tailor it. Um, and if some pilots want to work a little more off than on, as long as we can cover the workload, we're okay. So if we have a pilot that uh, wants to stay home a little longer and work, you know, and, and uh, you know, a little longer break, we're okay with that as long as we can schedule it. Like a lot of operations, like fire, things like that. I'm sure you deal with it. You know, when you're busy, you're busy. And, you know, we, we, have, you know, we have to make hay when the sun shines. So during our, our busier seasons are actually uh, spring and fall. Electricity, believe it or not, electricity demand is down in the Northeast, of course, in the summertime. You know, everybody's got their AC turned on right now. So the power companies don't want to give you outages and one shots. So we slow down a little in the summer, but come September, you know, it's goes time until usually January, and then it slows down a little bit. And then, of course, we're pretty busy again until the end of June. So, you know, again, as long as we have enough crews to handle uh, the work, we, we're okay with letting our policy and our work doing schedule. You, uh, you mentioned the progression, starting out with uh, somebody doing uh, inspections with a foreman and then moving up. On average, uh, what uh, amount of time does it take for one of your pilots to move from the uh, entry level up to where they're uh, flying everything? I'd say four years, depending on, you know, a little bit of timing, when are we doing training classes, things like that. But I'd say an average of four years. Usually six months, uh, they're getting along with crews, everything's working well, they do the platform class. Sometime after a year, they're doing a long line class. Sometime maybe a year or so after that, they're doing, you know, they're, they have enough time to do HEC. And then of course it moves on to, you know, uh, to doing um, uh, sock line and all that stuff. And one of the things that all our jobs are different, you know, if you were Southwest Airlines and you had a fleet of 737s, pretty much everybody flies the same equipment, everybody has the same skill sets. But one of the one of the challenges, and this is, even though you're doing platform work and you're checked out for platform, there's a big difference between doing it uh, near a structure over land, it's 100 feet above the ground, or going over a huge span of water and trying to put a marker ball up uh, you know, a mile span, you know, across, you know, across the Hudson River or Tennessee River, and, you know, where you have water moving underneath you, you know, it can cut, you know, references are, are poor, things like that. So, you know, so, so again, you know, I'm still learning. I've been here 13 years and, you know, uh, you know, you just, you know, even though you might be checked on something, you still, you, just, you know, you still, it may, that doesn't mean that person's going to go ahead and necessarily do a certain job. We, we look at the skill matrix and we decide, their entry level platform pilot, they're going to do this. You know, we're going to limit them to what they can do until they get their skills. They're getting good positive feedback from the crews they're working with, and then we might give them a little more advanced task. And then usually we're there with them to mentor them. You know, I'm there, or or one of our other trainers is there when there's a complicated task to make sure they don't have any trouble. You, you might have already mentioned this. Um, do you ever bring anybody from in from the outside that might move into say one of the middle positions without having started doing the inspections, or do you? promote continually uh, from within? We will if they have previous uh, relevant experience. So if they have parallel experience previously and they came from, you know, one of the, you know, one of our competitors or somehow have experience, we will move them into the position. But we typically, again, they still have to go through all our training programs. And usually in any situation, we will at least put them out with primary, just simple inspections for at least a rotation, <laughs> just to make sure we didn't miss anything, making sure everything is, you know, they are who they say they are, making sure that they're getting good feedback. So typically almost any time somebody starts here, they might start at least a rotation or two of simpler work, but then if that go that if, they, if they're showing that they can meet all the standards and then we'll train them, we'll, we'll still check them out all the things we do. And yes, they'll move up pretty quickly. Okay. Again, final question, what would an applicant need to do to make themselves a better candidate for you when they're applying for your company? Um, again, utility, previous utility experience is a plus. I know it's hard. It's, it's the old, uh, you know, chicken or the egg, um, getting your foot in the door, you know, the utility mafia, I call it. Um, you know, you have to be able to, you know, where do you, do you get the experience? How do you get the experience to get in? But uh, anything you can do, um, uh, if you can't, you know, any type of utility, uh, having some parallel patrol, um, persistence, definitely persistence. Um, I tell people all the time, they'll send me a resume. And uh, one of the problems you run into is, I'll get a resume from somebody maybe six years, six months ago, or somebody I talked to comes in. And then I don't hear from them 
And then we also have some attrition. We need to hire some pilots. And somebody says, hey, I know a pilot who's looking. And you talk to that pilot, and all of a sudden you hire them. Meanwhile, that person might be still interested. So because you get a lot of resumes, you talk to a lot of people. The big thing is I tell everybody, give me a call or text me or prefer email once a month. Let me know you're still looking. That definitely helps. Um, making sure you know, name recognition, keep showing your face, showing you're persistent. And if you are, you will eventually you probably become a pilot in the field. Now, the difference is, I always tell you, it's like a relationship, it's timing. I always say, if, you know, you, you like this person and you're, you know, you, you know, they're dating somebody else and you can't, you're not going to stick around forever. So you, you know, you, you, you date somebody else and, you know, then, then they break up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. And then, you know, so it's, it, it's kind of funny. It really is timing. You know, a lot of times all the pilot sends me a resume and then we're looking, but they just started a medevac job and they just signed, you know, they signed a training agreement and I don't blame them. They can't burn, they don't want to burn bridges. So, Sure. We're looking for pilots now, of course, you have to hire pilots. Then they're then they by the time you know the training agreements or the time they can move on, we we're good. So a lot of it is really just a lot of it's timing. Um I'd say persistence also, you know, getting relative experience. And um again, like like um a gentleman from the state police said, um basically uh, the big thing is um making sure that you uh you learn what you can about the company and uh you know knowing what we do helps and uh definitely visiting us uh we you know if you're, if you're in the area uh, you call make a visit um all those things definitely help okay sounds good well dan keep your camera and microphone on i invite uh, jay and mike to bring their cameras up i as they're doing that i am going to uh give another word of warning again for just a second guys to the uh, viewers uh we again want to make certain that you, if you follow the advice of these gentlemen, there is no guarantee of a job. Um, they are giving you career advice based on their experiences, based on what their current hiring practices are for their organizations or companies. It is simply a matter of uh, advice. Uh, we do wish everybody the best, of course, as we uh, as they progress through their career search. Now. Um, we do have a number of questions. I did run long. I talked to you guys. I really got into the conversations with you, so we ran a little bit long. Is there anybody that has to leave um, right at five o'clock before? You, can you go a little bit longer? Is that okay? I'm good to go. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, first question we have is from uh, Rick uh, Barlett. Um, it's uh, for Mike. It's uh, what bases uh, for LA Fire? I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but maybe where are the bases located around the LA region? All right, so the primary heliport is called Barton Heliport, and it's at uh, Pacoima Airport. Or I mean, I'm sorry, it's in Pacoima at Whiteman Airport. And all the aircraft come in in the morning at about 7.30. The crews are changed out. The aircraft are daily. Any scheduled maintenance is performed. Aircraft swap as needed, et cetera. Uh, pilots brief the oncoming pilots, offgoing briefs oncoming, and then they go out to the three locations. We call them North County Air Squad, East County, and West County. So we divide up the entire county essentially into three geographical regions. That is designed for um, basically the time required for response. And uh, the aircraft stays at that remote site for the 24 hour period and then comes back in. Okay. Um, related question uh, from Patrick Gustafson. Um, for many, the location of home is very important. Do any of the companies or organizations, um, is living out of state an option? Um, is that available? Or do they have to live near where your headquarters are? Or in Jay's case, where the uh, other locations are? If, if I may, I'll start off. Um, a lot of our pilots are retired military, and a lot of the states around Maryland offer reduced or no tax on your retirement income. Delaware, you know, is, is one. And uh, a lot of our pilots, there's no requirement for the civilian to live within the state. A lot of our pilots take advantage of that where they can live where it's best, uh, you know, more advantageous for them money-wise. And we don't restrict that at all. Okay, great. Dan, it sounds like your pilots are moving around all the time. Uh, anywhere. You live, anywhere you want to live in the, in the 50, I mean, we even had a pilot that lived in Canada. So we, <laughs> we pay, we pay travel um, back and forth. You know, we, we, we pay travel to and from the work and because it's such a transient 
position. We're okay. We have policy to live in Oregon, California. However, a good chunk of our work is in the East Coast, so um, it is a little more convenient because we have a bigger presence in the East Coast and the West Coast. So I'd say travel time, time zone differences, but it really doesn't matter. Okay, um, Mike, how about uh, for uh, LA County? Yeah, there there is not a requirement to live in California. Uh, I will say, however, if you do live out of state, um, it can create some difficulties when you have to contend with being recalled. As I had talked about a little bit uh, earlier, we do have some pilots uh, that live out of state. Uh, they fly in, they have a private airplane and they, they fly in for their schedule. Um, and if you're um, willing to deal with that, then uh, you're certainly free to do that. The, the union has negotiated that they can't force you to live now, it used to be that way years ago, actually. You had to live in L.A. County, but they changed that many, many years ago. Well, I was thinking, you know, maybe even living in Orange County or, uh, you know, down in San Diego or out in Palm Springs. So there's plenty of options in, you know, in your region. So Yes. Uh, Jay, this one's for you. Will Maryland take a Canadian commercial pilot license holder with a 139 rating? Well, one of two things has to happen. You either have to, well, we, we, we'd love to have the 139 people, believe me, but uh, one of two things has to happen. You either have to have, uh, be a US citizen or you have to have a work visa or a green card. One of those you have to have. Um, there are certain positions in the United States that you can do what's called a sponsorship. Uh, the state of Maryland has elected not to do sponsorships. Okay. Uh, have any of you considered a pilot progression or partnership program with other regional operators that might uh, provide a, a pipeline, you know, where they would uh, help train uh, pilots for some of your requirements? Well, that's kind of a complicated issue that really revolves around uh, labor, labor negotiations and unions and being a member of the fire department, et cetera. Um, so for LA County right now, that, that does not exist. We don't have an apprenticeship program. Um, when you're hired, you're hired directly as a, as a pilot with the expectation of uh, training and going to work. So. Maryland's, uh, the Maryland State Police, is, they're, we're pretty proprietary when it comes to things like that. Um, you know, aside from you know, our operations manual, our stand manual, you know, we have, we're insured. And, and our insurance carrier requires that, you know, we have, we follow the book, we train this way in order to, to be insured. Um, uh, again, just, we have a complete training section, uh, our IPs, we have, uh, like I said, we have four instructor pilots under our chief pilot alone. We have an instructor pilot at each one of our sections. We have a, like I said, we have an instructor pilot that's in charge of safety. And uh, we also have one that's in charge of our flight training device. Uh, but no, it's, it's like Mike said, we don't have an apprenticeship program. Like I said, we encourage people to come by, ask the questions, visit us, get to know us. You know, hey, what what better thing could you do but educate yourself? Okay, uh, this one's a little bit interesting, and uh, there's actually a couple of questions that kind of deal with this. Um, somebody who's coming fresh out of uh, school um, doesn't sound like uh, would be able to get picked up with any of you, but is age ever a factor uh, for hiring um, in any of your positions? No. No. You're not allowed to discriminate by age. No, and um, I don't, you know, I don't where people draw that uh, that line in the sand where they say, you know, you're you're old, you're too old. Now we our our pilots are are. We have some seasoned guys. We have some seasoned guys. Let's put it that way. And uh, you know, they they have a lot to pass on to the uh, to the younger folks too. Okay. Uh, as a follow up, um, person says they're 62 with 300 plus hours, also fixed wing, multi engine, and single engine landing commercial helicopter rated. What are the chances of getting a job? Um, and he also asks, uh, what class of medical certificates do you uh, require? LA County is class two. Class and I two think uh, Jay said class two as well. That yeah, seems, we're class two also. 
support. And Dan, okay, same thing. And the age obviously was not a, an issue. It sounds like he doesn't have the uh, flight experience at 300 hours uh, that any of you would be looking for either. Um, uh, for Mike, um, I tested last year in June, came out in band two. Just wondering if that list will expire or if it has already expired. Uh, you might have to explain what band two is. Yeah. So the list, uh, the list has expired. Right now, we are uh, forecasting a new test in uh, 2021. Uh, if all things go as planned, uh, the banding um, that has to do with where they. Uh, finish and then there's some civil service guidelines as to what what transpires after you're banded. Um, that's that's an internal organizational uh, piece to it. Okay. Um, question for each of you from Rudy Myers. Um, we'll start with Dan. How many new pilots are usually hired each year externally for each uh, organization? Boy, is it, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it, it would depend on the year. You know, it just depends. I'd say on average, probably four or five pilots a year we take on. Okay. For sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. It just depends on, on uh, you know, sometimes, like I said, one of our pilot, the pilot will, will have kids, family, and they'll want something that requires less travel. That's usually, again, why we most of the reason why we have attrition because of the because of the transient lifestyle of, of being a utility pilot. Indeed, um, Jay, how about you uh, with Maryland State Police? Well, An average average year. obviously varies, but you know when you have seventy-seven pilots, you're go you're going to have just the normal attrition. Um, you know, right now we're looking to fill uh, four SIC positions and two, four, six, eight PIC positions. Um, you know, do we fill them, you know, rapidly? No, it's, it's, it's government and it's a cumbersome process. Let's, let's face it. But, uh, you know, we use, we use a process called job apps, which is, um, uh, quite a monster, but, uh, to get through, but it, you know, it does work. It does work. It doesn't hamper us, but, uh, you know, there is a, there is a, a process to get hired. Um, normally I, I can't say there, there's a normal, you know, we could get, we could get lucky and and during one recruitment hire five or six people that, that that you know just everybody you know we shake our head and say thank goodness you know wow what what a great recruitment effort and then we could go through a recruitment effort and maybe hire just one it, it's you know it's, I don't want to say feast or famine but again it's all those things that that Mike and Dan and you talk about that people to make themselves more marketable in this very very competitive uh job the job of um job places yeah. it, it's it's incredible isn't that crazy how earlier this year first of the year we were talking about a pilot and aircraft mechanic shortage and uh what a difference six months can make uh mike i saved you for last because i kind of think i already know the answer um i believe you told me before uh, we started that uh LA County Fire has not hired somebody in two years. Is that correct? You, you, your people stay with you for quite a while. That that is correct. Um, unfortunately, uh, positions there are quite competitive. We have a pretty large applicant pool, and based on our experience requirements, as you know, we previously discussed, they're they're typically very experienced pilots that come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so the process is lengthy it's uh it's difficult it's expensive it's uh and and yes we don't do a test every year um it doesn't necessarily mean it would be at two year intervals or three it depends on the needs uh we will have needs and it cycles uh, based on the age the overall age of the group collectively so in the last several years probably uh, i'd say four or five years we've had a pretty significant change within our um, within our section in terms of the pilots. So uh, I'm not necessarily allowed to discuss the numbers in, in whole, but what I will say is the plan is for uh, early 2021 to test. I encourage everybody to watch the LA County Fire Department website. Uh, it also gets um, put out on uh, public sites as well. 
uh, but it's only open for a period of time, generally 30 days, maybe 45. So it's a quick snapshot and you got to be ready to, you know, ready to, to go with it. Um, and, you know, we're looking for the folks that are probably as close as possible to, to, to go to work and to meet our mission. And it really is unique. I was, I was quite shocked when I got there. I, I had a very unique and, and I was very fortunate to have a great background before I started. And I was like, wow, this is, this is a challenging environment and a challenging mission uh, as a public agency. So um, I think we've got a good process though. And, and, and we find the folks that we're looking for. Understood. Makes sense. Uh, we have a question from Portugal, uh, from Lima. Uh, knowing that today's aviation is increasingly moving forward uh, towards autonomous aviation in terms of helicopter operations, how do we envisage, envision this transition? Talking about a career as a pilot and what care should we take in technical training? Um, are there any thoughts about autonomous operations for any any one of the three organizations? Uh, let's start with Jay on this one. Ooh. <laughs> a good question. I uh, shoot. You know, we we I, I could tell you this much. I uh, I have a, a little map at, at work, and I have pins in it with um, every place that I've hired somebody. You know, generally. And if, you know, and I'm not just talking the United States, um, you know, as far away as Alaska or Hawaii, I have India, Italy, Spain, Portugal, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep going here, Peru, um, one, of our, one of our sections, our section Trooper 7, I call it the United Nations section because there's there I don't think I have somebody that was initially born in the United States maybe except one fellow. But uh I don't know that's a, that's that's a tough question. I I I I don't think the state police is uh is going anywhere right now. I I would tend to think uh you would probably stay as a manned aircraft. Uh, probably the same thing with you uh, Mike, is that correct? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've had some conversations, uh, lengthy conversations about some of the technology and how it could fit into uh, the firefighting operations. Um, and I think eventually it will have a certain role. I don't think that it's feasible to program what we're doing as the human and the aircraft and the flight profiles and the decision making that we're doing. One of the biggest aspects of our operation, in my opinion, is, is because of how dynamic it is, and the fact that you're a single pilot position. We do have a crewman on board, but it is a single pilot operation. We do that at night, flying night vision goggles on a fire. So uh, the level of maturity, the level of decision-making, the dynamic environment that you're in requires that they're very high level of ADM. And I don't know that you could ever program that into a machine. The automated systems that are in the machine now, especially our new one, they will assist us. They will assist us in our operation. But I don't believe that you can take the human out of it and still have the performance um, that you need in order to be, you know, operationally functional. Of course. Well, at least I hope not. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, right. we're lucky. We're on the end of our career, you know. And if that happens ten years from now, it might not necessarily affect us, but it sure affects the young folks. So, Dan, I can tell you this much: we we are looking. The Maryland State Police is looking at a, at a drone program for certain things that where you don't want to put a helicopter or something in somebody in harm's way but um you know other than that you know we we like i said we go to the world to try to hire people okay uh dan i i would wonder if you don't already have maybe a an autonomous program within your organization are you using drones for uh inspections or anything like that right now we we have a drone because obviously we are you know we're a paraline uh, inspection provider. However, um, you know again they have their place, especially if you're let's say you're a line crew at the power company and you have a uh, you know you, you've got a, a circuit out and you might need to just do something line of sight over a hillside and pop a drone up. Great, but for example, even just a simple stuff like an inspection right now with with current drones. Um, in one hour, I can, you know, you can do a patrol of 40, 50 miles. With a drone, the current drones, at least the ones that you can you know, use, uh, in, in somewhere like Western Pennsylvania or Kentucky, 
you would maybe get in an hour's worth of work, you might get the drone up. If you can get up to the right of way, because it's accessible, maybe get a span either way, and you might get half a span in, in, in a, you know, it might take you a day to do a mile, just because of that terrain. Now, if you're in the city or flatlands and you have to, you want a drone to maybe take some pictures, sure. And and again, you still need somebody to fly the drone, you need somebody to look at the, the lines. And um, you know, the military uses drones because, you know, the stuff they do is that people, people are shot at. So it's, it's, you know, it's a lot more risky situation where normally, normally nobody shoots, not, not, that hasn't happened, but people usually don't shoot at us. So that being said, uh, you know, for the patrol inspection, I see some potential. I mean, a for example for an autonomous drone would be something that can go out there, maybe do an infrared or go out after a storm and maybe do a thermal imagery or infrared, that sort of, that sort of thing, something simple. But we do a lot of construction, sock line pulling, you know, HEC, and to have a drone do external load operations with with humans on board, and uh, and and the thing is, you if you think about it, that's going to be a that, that's a certified aircraft, that's a an actual aircraft, and uh, I don't know whether there'd be any advantage of having a drone do that. It would be as expensive, if not way more expensive. So I don't know. I mean, I think like like the others have said, there are some uses of drones, but I don't think it's going to take. Uh, I don't think it's going to affect our industry, at least on the construction, um, repair side, anytime soon. Okay, we've got a couple of questions that are uh, asking the same question. One specifically for Dan, looks like the other one, uh, um, Andy Matichak and uh, Zach Meyer. Would attending a long line training course be a, uh, a good way to gain experience with external loads and, be and become an attractive candidate? Uh, uh, let's I start with Dan. I get that question a lot. and and it's not going to hurt, but if you came in with a 10 hour, 20 hour training class, we're still going to, uh, you're still not going to be out of the gate doing long line. We're still going to put you through a training class. I don't think it's a huge factor weighing in on a new pilot. Um, can't help. I mean, I mean, I mean, it can't hurt, excuse me, can't hurt at all, but you know, it take, it's going to be hundreds of hours before, you know, you're doing human external cargo, that sort of thing. So it's not, it's not a huge advantage. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a bad thing if somebody wants to get some experience, learn. All training is good training. So if they get a long line class from a third party, they're going to get something out of it and they're going to enjoy it and they're going to get some skill sets. But it's not enough usually to make a difference when we're looking at a resume. Um, okay. Uh, Mike, uh, Jay, what about uh, for your organizations? Does uh, long line training help? Well, that's uh... – go ahead, Mike. Mike, it looks like your microphone might have cut out. Uh, oh, I'm you... sorry. How about now? There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, we don't actually do long line in that sense for vertical reference. We do do external load uh, with the crewman. We do. A, we have a, a large animal rescue profile, plus if you need to move uh, large amounts of equipment around. So we, we do the external load, but not in the long line capacity like Dan, Dan does quite a bit of. However, I will say this, when I was talking about agencies versus working as a, for a, a contract to the Forest Service in the fire industry, most of the time they require you to be carted in long line. So they want to know that you have that skill. And sometimes companies don't want to spend the time or the money to train you in long line. Um, I had that experience because I guess a lot of pilots don't necessarily or can't be successful at it. So going through that course would at least tell that operator that, hey, I've done this before, I've met the standard on this skill, and it, it I think in some instances might very well be useful. To LA County, unfortunately, no. Understood. Uh, Jay? Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it, any exposure is always good, you know, but uh, like I said, with the state police, all our, our ships, or our ships are equipped with the hoisting operations and you know, when we do a, a hoist, it's it's the most unusual one. Uh, uh, we did one, a hoist, believe it or not, from a street in Montgomery County that was being flooded because of a 32-inch water main being broke. And we had to hoist the people out of the car. We, we um, did another hoist in Western Maryland on a 1,000-foot uh, smokestack 
that was um, under construction and the scaffold, the wood scaffolding caught on fire and we had to rescue those individuals. Um, uh, there's a park not too far from here called Rocks Park, which gives you an idea of uh, rescue the rescue operations there. And then one at a dam, we had one of the local dams where the people were lost power and were banging up against the dam. It, 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 most most unusual kind when when they do occur. But you know, as far as the training, you know, like I say, the state police is very very proprietary, and we have a set skill level that we want you to perform at and let's face it uh, it's it's an expensive proposition too to to keep that part of the training uh current with with our pilots and our and our um, our medics who do the hoisting itself sounds good okay we're gonna we just have time for a few more questions um i'm an assistant chief instructor pilot just broke a thousand hours and I'm wondering what I can do to build long line and fire experience to achieve landing a job with fire utility. Uh, Mike, I think you've addressed it once already. Do you mind uh, going through again real quick what you'd suggested? Well, uh, sounds like he's well on his way. Uh, unfortunately, I, apologize. I, think this is a, I think this is a she, uh, a Paige. I apologize, I should have mentioned that. Well, I think the commercial license is really where, where she's going to need to progress to. I didn't hear that mentioned. I think she said a thousand hours. So if she can, if she has that background um, already and gets her commercial license, I think if she is disciplined and goes out and makes those contacts, those what I call walk-ins, which I am a firm believer in, uh, to find that first job in an industry with a contractor or a company that that gets a annual contract with the forest service that she's on her way she gets that job she's going to work and she's going to work in the fire industry and at that point reputation is built time is built skill sets are built in the firefighting industry she'll be doing the long line and the external load she'll be working in those environments those uh typically austere environments where the fires are a uh, very dynamic environment learn all about it and there she, she set the foundation for it Dan, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to I just wanted to mention one thing that I forgot to mention earlier. There, there are a few ways when, when Mike's talking about fire, one of the problems you run into is for the forest service, you have 1500 hours to carbon PIC time. But a good way to get some time in, so as so it's a thousand hours, you're not gonna be able to go in and walk in. But some of the companies like HTS, um, construction, there's there are some opportunities for SIC in the fire industry. And that is a good way to get you, you know, to get in. You won't get any PIC time, build total time, and then maybe you can still work a season or flight instruct or something and get your 1,500 hours. So you can be less than a 1,500 hour pilot, work in the work as SIC, um, get your time, get some experience, like Mike says, get some contacts, and then once you reach that 1,500 hours, then you're a pretty good candidate. Okay. Sorry, no, that's fine. I was actually going to go to you next anyway, so that uh, fit right in with it. Um, let, any prospects for international pilots with FAA licenses for any of the three groups? Are you Jay saying Mark that it is a it is an applicant uh, that has an FAA license, but isn't but as a um, non-U.S. citizen? Um, not clarified, but I did see somebody earlier that was saying that they did not, uh, they were going to be coming to school here in the United States. This was a, an earlier question, um, to get a bachelor's degree. They wanted to see if they could fly, but they did not have a green card. So I'm, I'm guessing for each of you, a, uh, you would have to have a qualified status as a, being able to be employed internationally or being able to be employed here in the U S rather. Yes. yes. If you have, if you have the license. And you have that status to work. Yeah, we we've had Canadian uh, employees as well. That, um, it um, yeah, we've yeah, had yeah, a pilot, work for the green card. Yeah, so we have, we have international pilots, but they do have to be uh, have a green card at least or U.S. Citizen. Okay. And I'm going to uh, finish with a question from Gene Munson, who is on the uh, HAI working group uh, for safety. Um, for all three organizations, do you have a standardization IP for uh, each helicopter's type? Uh, Dan, do you want to start with that? Yes, we do. 
Okay, uh, Mike? We do not. We have a staff of four. The senior pilots are the training pilots, are the instructor pilots, and we work oh. together collectively on a, you know, within our training program, utilizing our air crew training manual as the standard for the training program. Since we all fly both aircraft, all pilots fly both aircraft. I guess you could say essentially we are the we are the SIPs in each of the airframes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, can you repeat the question? Is a standardization instructor pilot? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure I understand the question. <laughs> okay. I didn't, I didn't we don't have. That. I should say we have one for each aircraft. Uh, some of us do multiple aircraft, but okay. we do have an instructor pilot standardization program for each aircraft. And Jay, you I, only get you folks only have one aircraft type, so have, I would assume you have a, one aircraft. We have a we have a stand manual and operations manual and. These guys and gals are well versed in it. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to ask uh, each of you real quick on the way out. Um, what would be one thing you'd like to take the have the viewers take away from uh, your organization? Your 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 advice, um, and I'll, I'll take whoever answers first. What's uh, what's the parting wisdom you'd like to offer? Hit the button first. Huh? Uh, I would simply say, uh, be patient, be diligent. Uh, unfortunately, you have to be very flexible. You may have to move around to chase uh, some of the opportunities to, to kind of work your way through the system uh, to the area of expertise that you want to that you want to work in. Um, I would also say be very certain of what that area is and and, and focus on that because um, if you think you want to be in firefighting and then you decide you want to be in corporate and you spent you know five or six years kind of chasing that, then that's it's certainly not going to hurt per se, but um, stay relatively focused on on the the direction that you want to go in, in in that particular field and profession. Okay, who's Dan, Jay? Which which one next? I agree with Mike. That, um, you know, when you're coming and looking for a position with the Maryland State Police Aviation Command, you know, we want you to come here with the mindset that you want to make this a career. A lot of great opportunities. Uh, are here for upward mobility um, and we're going to do everything we can from the time that you apply to the time you're in training to the time you're in recurrent training to make you succeed that that's our goal we're, we're not here to, to and a lot of people say oh you know it's it's a police organization they're they're gonna you know they're gonna look at you and and, and treat you differently no 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 our, our goal is to get you to be the best pilot that we can possibly make you. Um, and we want you to succeed. And we want you to come to us with that kind of attitude. Um, a little time, sometimes a little hard for the military guys in transition, you know, let, let's face it, you know, you're a Lieutenant Colonel and uh, you know, you've been given orders. Now it's time to start taking some, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's learn, learn, take your, all your experiences and bring them here and and help make this place a better place okay thank you dan for you parting wisdom um, i'd say you know like, like Gemma said expose yourself so here's an example when i first started when i first got into flying i thought maybe i would like to you know fly uh you know i really enjoyed you know the instrument part of, of my training especially you know i also flew airplanes at the time and flew a lot of actual i really liked it i thought maybe that would have when i Decide to get into this. Like, well, maybe I'll uh, fly uh, medevac or fly, um, you know, corporate or something like that. But then I kind of got exposed to the utility world, and I really liked that. And I love long line. So, think, and I'm, and I think that that was the right choice for me. So, what I'm telling everybody is, if you um, are thinking about getting some career, don't. I have a lot of pilots. Um, I mean, like, I want to be. I want to do this. I want to be medevac. I want to do this. Close yourself. Uh, I know it's hard sometimes because you, you know, sometimes the only way to push up is to get hired. And uh, but visit, you know, Cal, visit, you know, Mike's operation or Jay's operation or our operation. Uh, you know, talk to everybody, talk to the pilots, see what they like, what they don't like. And you know, and, and you never know in life, you might pick one choice and you might decide this is not for me. But definitely don't go into it thinking I'm going to do this because a lot of times you realize once you get into it, you might prefer something else. Exactly. 
Wonderful, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time today. I can't tell you how much uh, I, I think that uh, this has proved valuable for our viewers. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for giving back to our industry. Um, I'm sure that everybody deeply appreciates uh, your time today. Thanks for having us, Dan. Absolutely. Right. Welcome you to uh, turn your cameras off. We'll wrap this up with some last minute housekeeping details. Uh, right, follow up you. questionnaire. We do have a follow up questionnaire that will be coming to everybody shortly. This is how we learned that you folks wanted a, uh, a webinar for pilot advice. Please let us know what else we can provide for you. Uh, save the date next week, Thursday at 4 p.m. our normal time. We are going to be talking about the standardization uh, for unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, we know that uh, they're coming into our industry and uh, what's the standardization process for that? Uh, watch for the link in email through social media, Rotor Daily. If you received a link for this one, you probably received a link for that one as well. Finally, as always, HAI is always trying to improve. What can we do better? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Please let us know. The best way to do that is through the email address president at rotor.org. That goes directly to our president, Jim Biola. He does assign it to the appropriate staff member for action. We'd like to know what we can do to make things better for our HAI members. Until next week, we uh, ask that you stay safe, that you fly safe, and we'll see you uh, next week. Thank you so much.